all I see is infinite possibility in this mm -hmm. universe. This universe, every atom, every particle of this universe is like throbbing with intelligence. And the law of one talks about this, right? They call it intelligent energy. They say the intelligence latent within the photon can be commanded and directed through the mind. In almost every encounter with ETs you hear, UFO stories, ETs basically have the same shape of form that they are described in. It's a huge, massive head with a brain like two to three times the size of ours. Almond-shaped eyes that are all black. And that's interesting, right? Because we know that the black is the iris, the center, which is what takes in light. So think about how much light, the spectrum of light, the frequencies of light that an extraterrestrial can see with those massive, all black, almond-shaped eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, wow, these beings are taking in a perception of the universe we cannot comprehend. They can see things we have no clue about. The interactions of energies and frequencies and things. They can read our auras, they can see our auras, know exactly how spiritually polarized we are. They're very godlike compared to us. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the New Age Sage podcast. This is the first episode in our my new studio. Um, it is pretty awesome. Very happy with it. Uh, my guest today is Aaron Apke. He we did our first podcast together. I didn't know him. Uh, you know, I consider him one of the best spiritual, if not the best spiritual teachers out there. And he's become uh, one of my best friends. And you know, we're come very close in this journey together. And it's we just wanted to try out a podcast now, being friends specifically about the Law of One. Uh, just a masterclass on the Law of One which he is an expert in and I have recently read. Um, but yeah, how you, how you doing today, Aaron? I'm excited, man. This is fun to be here in your new studio, which I've watched you manifest over the last three months. <laughs> it's it's exceeded all expectations. It's gorgeous and I'm excited to, to break it in with you today, man. Yes, sir. Let's go. Let's begin with a general overview of the Law of One for people who haven't watched it. So first off, how did it come to be? Like, first off, who is Ra? The mm -hmm. person created the law of one. And then also, how, what was the mechanism of his message being delivered to the people? I want to yeah. get into like the nitty gritty of like how first exactly did his message get channeled correctly so that we can actually feel that we can trust it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give the Christians what they want and say that Ra is a demon from the seventh <laughs> level of hell who comes Thanks. to disseminate the, the evil philosophy to the world. Now, the story is very cool, man. The Law of One is such a beautifully divine book for so many reasons, but <clears throat> one of them is the way that this book was manifested in the 1980s. So I'm a big, you know, UFO ET mm -hmm. fan and, and uh, student of that phenomenon. And what happened was there was a group of people led by a man named Don Elkins in the 1980s, like late 70s, early 80s. And... Don Elkins was a uh, professor of physics, I believe, might be chemistry, could be getting that wrong, but extremely brilliant guy. And he understood something very unique for his time. I think we kind of understand this now in the day and age we live in. But in the you know late 70s, Don Elkins realized, if I want to understand this phenomenon, of the UFOs that we see in our skies every day. And back in back in those days, there was a big pickup in UFO activity that had started happening. And so a lot of people were talking about UFOs back in, in those days, late 70s, early 80s. And he said, if I want to understand who these beings are, why they're here, and why they're clearly showing themselves to us, but not communicating with us, then we should probably get a lot more interested in their philosophy and their spirituality rather than their technology. Like, what are their anti-gravity? It's like, well, but that's not the most interesting question. It's why are they here without talking to us is the more interesting question. And so he developed the theory that we can channel using channeling as a, a medium to communicate with them because he rightfully, you know, ascertained that these beings are probably operating on very high levels of consciousness. They're clearly extraordinarily intelligent beyond our comprehension. I mean, mm -hmm. their craft, we've seen them do all kinds of things. We have no clue how they're doing that appear to break every law of physics we know of. Transmedium, travel, bilocation, literally disappearing into thin air and reappearing, materializing. So like we have no idea how these beings are doing this, but we watch it. So clearly these are beings from a very high level of consciousness. So he said, why don't we try to communicate to them as they probably communicate, which would be telepathically. 
They can probably just read each other's thoughts and things like that. And so he began a, a series of channeling with 12 other students, all men. That was his big problem, his first mistake. No women in the group. Women are always just tend to be way better channelers than yeah, men. For sure. yeah. And of course, it was the first woman who got introduced to the group who became the real channeler of Ra. But basically, Carla was dating a guy who was in the group and he brought her to a session. And I think that had a little bit of success channeling. There was an entity named Hatan, I believe, that they had connected with a little bit, but nothing truly remarkable yet. And Carla had been in part of the group. She had started learning how to channel and she was, Dawn could see she was very skilled. So one day they're doing a, like a student training session or something of channeling where Carla was doing a practice channeling to teach and show the students how it looks. And as she's practicing, uh, she gets this connection that comes through, I am Ra. Mm -hmm. And they had asked a few questions to this entity. And I think she probably did this regularly, like with Hatan or some other entity, and they can have some basic communication. But when Ra came through, it was like stunningly advanced and unique and stuff they'd never heard of before. And so Don was like, oh, wow, we got something here. And apparently right at that moment, Jim McCarty, who was the scribe, was walking in the door with arms full of grocery bags. And he's like, I'm, I'm back, you guys. I got all the groceries. And Don's like, Shh, quiet, bro. And he's like, we're in a session. And he's like, oh. And Don's like, we got something, dude. And Jim was like, really? And so they review the tapes and they decided we got to have a dedicated channeling session for this entity. So they began the Law of One sessions or the raw contact in January of 1980. And it was a 100 and, uh, 106 sessions over four years. So at the, at the beginning, they're doing like a session every other day. Mm -hmm. And then they slowly tapered off. Carla has some health issues, but they go through this question and answer over a four year period with this entity named Ra. And you said, who is Ra? They ask Ra that pretty much off the bat. And Ra says, we are a sixth density social memory complex. So one of the confusions with the law of one is that Ra is the sun god from Egypt, from Egyptian mythology, and Ra is not. Mm -hmm. Those are two separate things. But Ra explains that they visited the Egyptians uh, 11,000 years ago because they, they saw that Egypt was in a predicament at that point where they were caught in a perpetual spiritual childhood, Ra said. And they said that the average age in those days was only 30 years old. And so that's nowhere near long enough to live a human lifetime to gain any real spiritual development. I mean, you're 25, very spiritually advanced for your age. And I bet you would probably say like, oh, I need a lot more time here to figure this human experience out. You know, yep. it's a lot to integrate here. So 30 years, it's like you're going to be reincarnating forever as a human. So they saw the plight of these ancient Egyptians and the Egyptians were pantheists or panentheists who believe that the creator is in everything. Everything is a form of God. So they were like, hey, these people believe in the law of one. Let's, you know, it's not a violation of our, of their free will then to go contact them. And so there's a process that Ra explains in the law of one that whenever any positively polarized extraterrestrial civilization wants to communicate with a planet or like come openly on a planet, they have to go through the council, the council of the nine, which are like the nine uh, most advanced or oldest social memory complexes mm -hmm. in our portion of the galaxy. So it's a, honestly a bit like Star Wars with the Jedi Council. Star Wars is honestly like a really good analogy for the universe we live in. Uh, it's not exactly true, of course, but like the basic principles you're working with in Star Wars, you can just accept that like that's all the universe we live in. Yeah. There is a force which they call the law of one. And they say the law of one can be wielded by the light or the darkness, yep. Jedi or Sith, you know, indiscriminately. The law of one doesn't blink at light or darkness. It's available equally. But there are very different ways you have to utilize mm -hmm. it on the dark or light side. So they're, they're asking Ra all these super interesting questions and getting even more super interesting answers. And this is the thing to me, Lucas, that stood out with the law of one. And I've, I've read so many texts and... There's many texts that stand out to me, but the law of one stood out above the rest in a very unique way because of this, the incredible accuracy and uniqueness of the material. 
The Law of One reads almost like a science textbook in some ways, yeah. but with this incredible metaphysical paradigm on top of it. So you're really mixing metaphysics and spirituality with real science and a scientific understanding of the universe. So I have, um, you know, I have many people reach out to me, email or in the comments or whatever, or I'll meet sometimes uh, scientists who are like, hey, I'm a, I'm a physicist or an astrophysicist and never been super into spirituality. It's all, you know, woo woo. But man, when I heard you talk about the law of one, I got interested and I read the text and I fell in love with it. And like, it was speaking spirituality to me in a language I could really relate with, which is kind of more of that scientific language. Before we continue just to, cause the text has meant so much to me. And whenever I've tried explaining it to people who are more rationalist, uh, agnostic or atheistic, their defense is basically, um, they can't believe the channeling and they say, you mm -hmm. know, who says that this person didn't, didn't just create this narrative to sell science fiction story that suited their own perspective of reality. So like, what is mm -hmm. your hardcore evidence that this was an actual channeling from an entity and not some guy just being like, be a genius guy being like, coming up with the best science fiction book ever? Yeah, obviously yeah. I believe it, but I'm just saying this for the people who are doubting it, just because I want them to allow themselves to immerse in this ideology because it is, mm -hmm. in my understanding, the truth. Yeah, this is a really good contention to address because I understand completely why somebody would be skeptical. And I am very skeptical of channeled works. There's only a handful of channeled works I've read that I really, you know, put on that level of authentic in my mind of like, there's no doubt that this is a genuine divine channeling from a from higher knowledge or a higher density being. It's a Law of One, Course in Miracles, I Am Discourses. There's a few others I would put near that category, but again, the profundity of the material is nothing touches the Law of One. Not the, not the Apostle Paul, he's not there too, bro? <laughs> he was channeling something, bro. <laughs> um, so to, my answer to this question is, firstly, that I don't think it's radical at all. I know I understand that it's a radical idea for where human consciousness is today that we can communicate mind to mind. But that's like, oh, come on. You expect me to believe that people are talking through their thoughts and you can channel other people? That's crazy talk. I get that because that's where human consciousness is right now. It's a very rationalist, reductionist mentality still. But like I live in a paradigm very similar, I'm sure, to where you live, where it's like all I see is infinite possibility in this mm -hmm. universe. This universe, like every atom, every particle of this universe is like throbbing with intelligence. And the law of one talks about this, right? They call it intelligent energy. They say the intelligence latent within the photon can be commanded and directed through the mind. But the key is. And this is, again, one of those really profound things the Law of One teaches that you go, wow, that answers so many questions. Mm -hmm. Law of One says you can only manipulate intelligent energy through thought once you gain a polarity. Before you gain a polarity, you don't have a charge in consciousness to create, to do work. And the word work, like in chemistry, means the ability to create change in the environment. So my consciousness can't create any real change in the environment, like physically, like lifting up this cup or something until it gains a charge. And that charge is the polarity, which the law of one teaches. There's the positive and the negative. Those are the only two charges available, just like in chemistry. Mm -hmm. Every sentient being in the entire universe must choose which of these two polarities they prefer. And that's what the purpose of this third density realm is. So part of the limitation of why we can't manipulate with our mind is because we don't have a physical body that's on the same frequency to have that charge. Yeah. Ra says we're in a third density body. Third density bodies usually don't have a charge yet because they're choosing their polarity still. But a fourth density being with a much more advanced physical body. I mean, if you look at like the classic depiction of an ET. In almost every encounter with ETs you hear, UFO stories, ETs basically have the same shape of, of form that they are described in. It's a huge, massive head with a, you know, a brain like two to three times the size of ours. Uh, Almond-shaped eyes that are all black. And that's interesting, right? Because we know that the black is the iris, the center, which is what takes in light. 
So like if I sh shine a flashlight on your eyes, your iris will shrink because it's too much light. So it's trying to push out the light. Mm -hmm. If you're in the darkness, the iris opens and gets big so it can take in more light. So think about how much light, the spectrum of light, the frequencies of light that an extraterrestrial can see with those massive, all black almond shaped eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, wow, these beings are taking in a perception of the universe we cannot comprehend. Yeah. They can see things we have no clue about. The interactions of energies and frequencies and things. They can read our auras. They could see our auras, know exactly how spiritually polarized we are. They're like, they're very godlike compared to us. But it's just the next density above ours. You know, it's not that advanced from the large spectrum. Mm -hmm. So my, my response to the contention would be you have to read the material for yourself to discern whether this would be authentic or not. And one of the things that gives me uh, the best piece of evidence for the authenticity of the law of one is that the group LNL Research, Don, Jim, and Carla, the three who had the sessions in the 80s, they gave everything for free from the start. They were like, this is a very sacred mission we're engaged in to deliver the law of one which is purported to be the ultimate and highest spiritual philosophy available in the universe. There is no higher teaching than the law of one. So they say that's a very sacred calling to us. We don't want to monetize this and try to get rich off of it. So they put it all online and they do sell books and really nice books you can buy if you want to read mm -hmm. it in book form. But I read it through, I listened to it on Audible and through their website. And so the fact that they've not monetized it is a big sign to me that it's, they're very authentic and genuine with yeah. the material. But secondly, when you read the material, first of all, there's a number of things that Ra says in the 80s that were like crazy for back then, that when people read it, they were like, come on, Ra, you expect me to believe. And this is a contention that Dawn gives Ra in The Law of One. And it's so funny, isn't it, reading it 40 years later, where Dawn's like, come on, Ra, you expect me to believe that our government has ufo craft <laughs> and that they've back engineered that come on people are not going to even want to read this book anymore if i put yeah, that yeah. in there and Ra's like it's up to you if you want to put it in and now we're like oh of course they do they have way crazier stuff than that mm -hmm. so you know there's that there's um there's the fact that Ra talks about their civilization came from venus and they said that we lived on venus i think a few i think two billion years prior to when we did um and they said our planet was very harshly bright because yeah. it's one planet closer to the sun. So they said the, the conditions on our planet were nowhere near as harmonious as Earth's conditions. And so they said we didn't have the luxury to fight with each other and have, go to war and stuff. We're all trying to survive on this harshly bright, hot planet. So they built a society kind of into the planet and would do very little activity on the surface because of the harshness in third density, at least. And they evolved on Venus like this. And uh, this was long before science had discovered that Venus was in the Goldilocks zone two billion years ago. But it was September of 2019. An article came out from, I, I don't know if it was NASA or some other space organization that said science, scientists have now determined that Venus was in the habitable Goldilocks zone about two billion years ago and almost certainly had oceans and life and some form of organic life on it. And I saw the article and was like, this is incredible. This is exactly what Ra says in the 80s, that their civilization lived on Venus two billion years ago. When and also the, the, the authors zone. of the book would have no idea of knowing this either. Like of course. They weren't astrophysicist experts. They would have no, no. fucking clue. Yeah. No, and then, and then you get into the densities model, which is the most brilliant model for consciousness I've ever seen. And it just, it resonates from top to bottom as like, this is absolutely the way consciousness works. Mm -hmm. You can verify it in our direct experience right now. So there's so many things like that that I say, nobody would come up with such incredible spiritual genius that's in this book and then not monetize it and make money off of it if you were faking it. You know, yeah. if you have the lack of integrity to fake a book and lie and pretend like it was channeled, then you probably would have the lack of integrity to want to make money off of it too. They also, they paid a, they paid a price themselves, right? The Huge, yeah. The health price, and you and I have experience doing minor, minor, minor cha channeling. And even in that minor experience, you get wrecked. Your energy's Very destroyed. Very depleting, yeah. And the woman who was channeling was had severe health issues because of the channeling, just the amount of energy it took. And she had her own health issues that 
couldn't heal exactly because of the energy she wanted to give the channeling. Um, so she got sicker and sicker. The guy who helped ended up shooting himself, you know, in, in the head as well mm -hmm. from all the, you know, you can go into that from the, the you know, negative, uh, the yeah. demonic uh, presences that yep. from, from the channeling, from trying to fight the, the spoken word of, of Ra. That to me makes me believe it. The fact like, yeah. that they went through hell and back to deliver this. Yeah. And they chose to because they knew it was the highest truth there could be to mankind. Yeah, and all to make no money off of it. Yeah. I mean, that's it's pretty hard to argue with integrity like that. Yeah. So now we've hopefully those listening can believe this is his truth. I, I know it is truth. And so does uh, Aaron. But for me, what the law of one has helped me the most with is when I first started this journey, when I spiritually awakened, there was like a light spiritual awakening. Where I was like, oh, everything's love like consciousness is cool i can choose what i think oh my god mm -hmm. and there was a second spiritual awakening which is like man there is some demonic ass shit going on here you know like the satanic yeah. stuff the sacrifices the adrenochrome you know all that shit when i realized it was it was true it was horrible it was horrifying it yeah. was miserable it was painful i just didn't know it and, and not many people can allow themselves to go there I, I don't believe someone's truly spiritual until they've acknowledged and speak about the darkness because it's, it's a core part of this universe what i'm Absolutely. saying that is that the only thing that gave me hope from that spiritual awakening was the law of one, mm -hmm. specifically in understanding why that negative polarity exists, yeah. why the evil exists. So I think it's a good place to, to go into now because that that is ultimately the most healing philosophy I've, I've integrated from this law of one is to mm -hmm. have compassion and love for the negative polarity. Before it scared the fuck out of me and it caused so much negativity because I, I didn't understand it, I was scared of it. So let's go into that. Firstly, okay, what is a negative polarity mm -hmm. or evil? Why does it exist here? And why do we choose to come to a plane that has all this so-called, you know, demonic, demonic shit going on? Mm -hmm. uh, demonic let, shit. Let, let's start there. Yeah, you know, we could dice this down in so many ways and, and be very long-winded. So I'll try to give a shorter summary because these are deep questions that people wrestle with, people have wrestled with for thousands of years. But the law of one, it, again, it, just, it is the mythological core component of every story ever. Yeah. Good and evil. Why are we here? Why do we come here? Why is the universe appearing in this way mm -hmm. rather than some other way? Because when you're living as an ego, you look around at the universe you're living in, you're like, oh, I could do better than this. Yeah. You know, I could think of a better rule set. And, and that's, you know, that's third density consciousness for you. So let's start with the understanding that there's only one being, that's the law of one. Mm -hmm. the law of one says there's only one being in existence. They call it the one infinite creator. They don't use the term God because um, that's a very convoluted term, but you can call it whatever you want. And that creator is- What do you call it? I, I love the word God. Okay. I use God, creator, source, universe. Uh, that creator is indivisibly one with itself, with its own nature. It can't be other than what it is. And so the creator supposedly or apparently wants to experience itself. And some people might say to that, do say to that, well, how do you know God wants to experience itself? And my answer is, well, don't you want to experience yourself? Mm -hmm. Don't you want to go have pleasure and fun and ex enjoy things and grow and, and learn and evolve? Of course you do. So that means God does too. <clears throat> because in the book of Genesis, God says, let us create man in our own image and after our own likeness. Yeah, even in our own dream world, it literally is all different parts of ourselves in the dream. Yep. You know? So, and I don't, I don't mean this to say like, God was so lonely and lacking and all, <laughs> all sad and said, how do I experience myself? It's not like that. It's more like God is knowledge itself, right? And so God has to know itself because God is all knowledge. God is omniscient. But so you say, how does God go about knowing itself when it can't walk one step away from itself to turn around and look at itself? You know, yeah. it's like a knife can't cut itself. A scale can't weigh itself. A tooth can't bite itself. That's the predicament God's in. So God creates a counter nature, an opposite nature or an anti nature to itself to be like the mirror or the contrast by which it can know black from white, up from down, mm -hmm. love from fear. So nothing, this is a metaphysical law, nothing can be known without contrast or polarity. Everything has to have an opposite. So the negative polarity is the exact opposite of God's essential nature. And this is not something the law of one goes into in great detail, 
but I have to extrapolate this for people to help them understand it because the understanding of polarity can be a little bit tough. Like, why is there a negative polarity? Why not just make everything positive polarity? Mm -hmm. But the law of one explains this. So Ra actually calls the negative polarity the path of that which is not. And that's because there is not separation in the universe. There is not isolation or division in the universe. So it is a path of illusion. But nevertheless, being the exact opposite of God's nature, which is oneness and unity and love, then it it is given room to express in the universe so that it can provide the backdrop by which love and oneness can be known. If there wasn't an opposite thing from oneness, we couldn't know oneness. Mm -hmm. So this is the premise we're working with ontologically. So then, well, what's interesting is that first there was just the positive polarity. And Ra says this in the law of one when they're asked, you know, how did the negative polarity come into being? Was it just from the Big Bang at the start of the universe? There was two polarities or did it evolve? And again, here's where we get the really incredibly satisfying answers from the law of one. Ra says, no, in fact, every universe that, it, that appears and disappears, you know, there's a Big Bang uh, explosion and then an implosion at some point, mm -hmm. trillions of years, who knows? But every universe that bangs and then implodes on itself is like the heartbeat of God. And there's just universes coming in and out of existence forever. They say that's like the heartbeat of the creator. And every universe is a new experiment the creator is running. And so from the, at least from the level of creation, the creator literally doesn't know what the result will be until the experiment is played out, just like yeah. you or I in a science lab. So it really is as above, so below. Yeah. Now I do think there's an aspect of the divine outside of physical time and space that already knows everything. Yeah, of course. But we're experiencing the other side of that coin in mm -hmm. physical reality, where it feels like there's time and space and linearity and stuff. Yeah. So on this side of the coin, it's as if God doesn't know the results of the experiment. So God will set up or the creator will set up certain parameters, laws of physics, zodiac archetypes, you name it. And it goes from galaxy to star to planet to person. Everything is a type of logos, they call it which is kind of passing down the creative order from one structure to the next. So Ra says, when the universe began, there was no thought of a negative polarity yet. In fact, there was no polarity really, because there was just one, there was just the positive. And they said, the result of that experiment was that souls spent way too much time, probably millions and billions of years in third density, because there wasn't a veil of forgetting. So we incarnate here in third density, but we remember all our past lives. We know why we're here, what the universe is, that there's only one creator. Mm -hmm. We know all the answers to the test. Yeah. So Ra says the result of that was that kind of like children in school who are not rewarded if they do their homework and they're also not punished if they don't pass their tests. Then you get this situation where the kids just goof around all day because there's, there's no reason to do the work and there's no punishment for not doing it, right? So the logos, which again, every star is a logos, every galaxy is a logos. When a logos, like a star, you know, creates a planet with people on it, Ra says all the data in the universe is known by every other logos because they share one mind. So it's like every experiment is getting the data pushed back into the, the logos mind. So every star has access, every galaxy has access, every planet has access to all the information of every experiment in the universe. So they can say, okay, so this has been tried and this was the result, let me try this. And they mm -hmm. do little twists. One example is, Ra says on our planet, uh, on Earth, they the Logos decided to create human beings with an extra large uh, thumb, opposable thumb. They call it the grasping thumb so that we could grasp tools early on in our evolution. And the Logos wanted to see, what is this gonna do? And what it did is it created, it led to weapon making very, very early and war and tribalism because now we can craft tools to fight each other and we have very advanced battle strategies. So that's where that experiment led. So these are the ways that the Logos are always trying new variations on everything. And so Ra said at some point, a Logos, a star, I think, said, I've got a nice idea. What if we don't let the souls remember who they are or why they came here, or have literally any access at all to the other side. 
So they're, we're going to plop them in this virtual reality game, but wipe their brain completely clean. So they have no remembrance of why they're here or what life's all about. Let's see what happens. So this incredible experiment somewhere in the universe, and maybe it was even a prior universe, I don't know. But Ra says the experiment was a decided success because what it did was it created fear and separation from the creator because now there isn't the knowledge of oneness just freely given to everyone. It's got to be earned and remembered, right? So most beings in third density now don't know why they're here, feel afraid, feel like they're lacking, don't understand how to connect with source or what source is. And so they said the negative polarity was born from this experiment. So they called it the veil of forgetting. And they said the veil of forgetting was what caused or allowed for the negative polarity to be born. And from that point forward, all the other logos in the universe were like, oh, this was a great experiment. Because what it did was it sped up the evolutionary process exponentially of third density. It went from billions of years to like 25 to 75,000. Yeah. And they were like, oh, that's the sweet spot. That's how we want third density to be. So third density, which again is what we're all in right now. This is a third density planet under the veil of forgetting. It is like a pressure cooker for the soul yeah. because you come here and there's an equal amount of positive and negative polarity. And that's important because our souls need to taste both to truly make the choice. You know, if I only give you one choice, Lucas, and over and over here, here, take this, take this. I can't say you have freely chosen that thing because I've never presented you with another option. So the universe needs everyone to have at least two options and it doesn't care or judge which one you choose because again, even the negative plays an important role, but you do have to choose or you don't get out of this realm. You ha Your soul has to keep reincarnating here. Mm -hmm. And to ground this in mythology, the way I understand it from, you know, beyond the esotericism is that, you know, if you watch a movie, you know, any Marvel movie or Star Wars or something, and you were just left in this in the stage of the character just living his life as it was, mm -hmm. with no encounter with darkness, no encounter with evil, you wouldn't meet the hero, right? The hero yeah. is met, or I mean, the hero is a consequence of, of positive polarization, right? Through encounter with a negative you got it. polarity. So exactly. it's like, you know, if, uh, is it? Jordan Peterson, meet the law of one. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, if, if <laughs> is it Anakin or Luke Skywalker, who meets Darth Vader? I haven't seen it in so long. Well, Luke Skywalker. Okay, so if Luke Skywalker didn't meet Darth Vader, he wouldn't have been the hero, right? So it's right. like if, if yeah, fucking you know, Batman didn't meet the Joker, it wouldn't be Batman. So it's like a we have to encounter the, dark, the darkness to find our highest evolution of self. Mm -hmm. um, Same is true for the negative polarity, by the way. If they don't meet beings of light that they get to kill or corrupt, they can't be the villains either. Yeah. So br branching off this now for I think the most useful tool of my experience has been my evolution how to understand my encounter with medical polarity with increased wisdom mm -hmm. in in civically like how to utilize it to advance myself and also how to recognize it so i don't get fucked over myself so mm -hmm. i want to go into now the mechanisms of the negative polarity yeah uh so people can recognize this operation right so it, for me it's been massively useful in seeing people ne negative polarity so That's i don't, so they don't fuck with me but then also knowing how to utilize it from my own polarity. Like, so the question is like, one, what are the core characteristics of someone who is negatively polarized so we can know to save ourselves? Mm -hmm. And secondly, if we do encounter negative polarity, no, negative polarization internally and externally, how can we best use that to gain positive polarity? Yeah, this is such an interesting topic. We'll see how much of this we actually get through because it's <laughs> so juicy, man. It's so good. And I agree with you. It's so important for anyone on any level of spirituality to start acquainting themselves with the strategies of the darkness or the negative polarity. Because if you don't know their strategies, that's how they succeed. They succeed by hoping most people don't understand what their goal is, how they go about accomplishing that goal. And they wanna trick you to think that something else entirely is happening. Mm -hmm. And so the first like tip I would give to how you can spot a negatively polarized individual and I'm not even talking about like spirits or entities, like physical people that are moving towards or have graduated to the negative polarity. Most of them are in politics. <laughs> um, it's very, very obvious once you understand the differences between the polarities. And this is why I just, I have to laugh at people who say like, how do you know the law of one wasn't channeled by a demon? It's like, how do you know the sky is blue? Yeah. You look up and can see it's blue. It's as obvious as the noonday sun. 
but you have to understand, again, the differences of negative beings will not and do not do X, Y, Z things. Positive beings will never and do never do certain things. So what are those things? The first thing a negative being does is they have to deceive you and they have to gain your free will freely somehow. So why is that? Why? Because if, you, if you're imagine a negative polarity being, like why would they give a fuck about free will, right? Yeah. It's well, like, they don't. It's like what, why is it part of the law that they have to not infringe their free will? Yeah. They only care about it to the extent that it gives them power. They don't actually care about other people's free will. Oh, so will. They, gain, they gain bonus XP per se oh, if yeah. they fuck with you with by you allowing it basically yes okay yeah they don't care like you know we want lucas to choose the negative polarity of his own heart yeah no 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 no. because manipulate manipulation is, is a core part of it yes yeah. it's like we need his energy so what do we say to this idiot to get him <laughs> to believe in our philosophy and be in, are enslaved to us yeah so they are masters and i mean masters of deception and manipulation of the human ego if you've got an ego that you think like I'm a good person. I'm virtuous. You're done for. They've got you by the hook already. It's all the, the woke idiots, yeah. Yeah, they play on people's need, the ego's need to look virtuous to the group. That's one of the first ways in, in any planet on any, in any galaxy, not just ours. This is one of the chief strategies. It's called false light. So this is the first most obvious way that you can know that you're looking at or dealing with a negatively polarized entity. They will tout virtue almost nonstop and they will try to present an image of themselves of like, I'm such a clean, good person. They try to present to you the exact image you wish you could present to the world. Um, put together, I dress well, I look good, I sound good, I say all the right things and I never say something that's not virtuous or that could be, you know, taken mm -hmm. as being bad. So it's like, I'm literally like an angel in human form. I'm so freaking virtuous. I'm so moral. I care about everybody so much. Yeah. Be careful. That is the negative polarity. And it's, it's factual in its efficacy because, you know, there's a movie, I'm trying to bring this again, these mythology called The Thing, and it's basically about a, a negative ET alien. It's a movie if you haven't seen it, uh, about negative ETs. And the way the negative ET works is that it'll basically there's like a team of people in Alaska doing a mission and they'll basically take over one person and like become them literally just like become yeah, the, yeah. The, the body. And why I say that is that like, if you saw a, a, a ET that looked demonic, you would see it's a demon and be like, get, Yo, you'd get, run away. get the fuck away from me. But if you, if it's impersonating something you love and appreciate, yep. that thing's fucking got you. So that, yep. that's like, you know, if you, it, the demon you can't see is the one that ends up eating you. Yes. And that's the thing, right? It's like, if only it were that simple, that negative beings, are these mustache twirling villains we can see from a mile away <laughs> or that they say things obviously evil, right? No, no, no. They say everything you want to hear, brother. They say all the stuff that you say, oh, that sounds nice. That's good. And let's get more specific with this. What is false light? It's really the attempt to control people through virtue. See, real virtue will never weaponize itself against somebody. True virtue will never put somebody in a corner and to try to control them into a decision. Mm -hmm. But that is how the negative polarity uses it. So this is why it's called false light because they will use your light against you. Ra calls this the spiritual neophyte. Say they look for the spiritual neophyte. Negative entities want nothing to do with truly advanced, positively polarized beings because they know, it's like they know that we know that they know. You know, mm -hmm. like they know how this works. They know all my strategies. They know all my tricks. I can't trick them. I can't deceive them. And they can potentially depolarize me greatly if I'm not careful. So they they stay away. Like this is something you'll see in almost every religion, Judaism, Christianity, especially. The demonic, which is really the negative polarity. If you are truly walking in the light, they don't want nothing to do with you. They'll stay so far from you, you'll never encounter them unless you encounter them in somebody else, right? Somebody else who's demon possessed. You will not be tormented by demons or negative entities if you're truly walking in love with an active heart chakra. Mm -hmm. They literally can't go near you because a negative, the negative polarity doesn't have any power at all within itself. The negative polarity thrives on stealing power from others. So if they don't think they can steal your power, they don't want nothing to do with you. So they mm -hmm. go after the gullible, right? And every human being has light. Every human being is, in my estimation, and definitely according to the law of one, 
at the core, every human being is good and holy and innocent and perfect because we are made in the image and likeness of God who is perfect and holy. So everybody has light. But if somebody hasn't woken up to their light, if they're not a self-aware person yet, they are the perfect target for the negative polarity because they'll come in with some kind of philosophy that sounds good with sweet words and smooth talking. And they'll say, you, you're a good person, right? Well, you don't want to do X, Y, Z because that would make you racist, right? Oh yeah, no, I don't want to be racist, right? Because you're too good of a person to be racist. Only the bad people are racist, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. bad people are racist and I'm not one of those bad people. So they're playing on the sort of kindergarten level of awareness they're dealing with in the person. Because one of the things ego does that causes it to overlook reality and have all this cognitive dissonance we see from the left and the right is that it paints everything over simplistically. Like everything is as obvious as a cartoon comic book or something. It's like there's just the good guys and the bad guys. And it's that simple. And of course, it's not that simple. You know, whether it's the left judging the right or the right judging the left, you can see the same distortion in both camps, which is that we're the good guys. The other side are obviously the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, right? Because you're like, does that worldview work or help anyone at all? Because look, man, you can think they're the bad guys all day, but do they think they're the bad guys? No, they think they're the good guys. So if you want to resolve this massive conflict and divide, you might as well accept, look, they think they're right. We think we're right. They think they're on the good side. We think we're on the good side. Let's sit down and talk. Let's figure out our differences. The negative polarity wants to always do the opposite of that, right? No reconciliation, only further division and polarization. So I have to keep feeling better and better. Like I'm definitely on the good side because I don't do this and that and I don't say these things and whatever it is. And they do, so they're bad and I can judge them and stay away from them. These are the tactics of the negative polarity is divide and conquer, which we've seen every great military empire do. You know, it's the problem reaction solution strategy you know <clears throat> the negative polarity and i know you know this only has a couple of plays in their playbook that they're not like crazy complex um battle artisans or something it's literally almost always in any endeavor it's going to be the problem reaction solution which is we create a problem and of course we have to hide from you that we created this problem whether it's covid or you name it the next is we control the reaction to the problem by we ourselves reacting in a certain way and also through controlling the media and politicians. We make sure everybody reacts how we want them to react, which is always what? Fear, doom and gloom, you know, fear, porn, division, same stuff every time. It's always a really bad, scary thing and they need to get everybody into a fear state. We know fear is the number one weapon of the negative polarity. Once they get everybody into a fear state about the problem they created, they come in as the saviors. We have the answer. It's this vaccine or whatever, right? And they, they're trying to get you to willingly walk into their trap because that's again how the negative polarity gains more negative polarity is by infringing on free will voluntarily. So like they can't just come to a planet and throw every person on that planet into a jail cell and say, we own you now. Now we're more negatively polarized. No, uh, uh It's much more challenging than that for the negative. They have to come to a planet. They have to look very impressive and say, oh, look at us. We're intelligent. We're powerful. We're beautiful. If you guys serve us and, and follow our philosophy, we'll teach you how to have this power. We'll give mm -hmm. you some power. And then the people of that planet have to say, yes, we will be your servants. You'll be our masters. Then they can polarize. So it's an exact opposite of the positive in that the positive polarity polarizes by honoring free will, by never infringing, by only coming to serve and to heal and to bless. And if the positive thinks they're infringing on free will, they won't interact with you. That's how sacred it is for them. If they infringe on free will, they lose positive polarity, which they have to go gain back. The opposite is the case for the negative. If the negative tries to infringe on somebody's free will, and they're met with love or truth or whatever, that opposite energy, the negative loses polarity. So that's why, again, they're very careful to target people that they're pretty sure are not gonna respond with real light. Mm -hmm. They're gonna get sucked into the traps and the deception and fall into the, the plan. So you have this interesting dichotomy, right, of 
positive and negative polarity interacting on our planet and everywhere. And they, they literally use opposite rule sets with the law of one to polarize. And so again, when you know how the negative polarity polarizes, they have to trick you into willingly giving your free will to them. That's it. Then you can just ask the question of, am I being manipulated right now so that they can gain my freedom, my free will? They are, am I being asked to donate some of my freedoms, my free will, my power to this organization or this person? If yes, it's negatively polarized every time. It's that simple. The positive will never ask you to give up your freedom or your free will. Even, even in these issues in our country right now that are like extremely, you know, uh, controversial, let's take abortion. For example, as, as a student of the law of one, here's my take on abortion. I think obviously murdering anything is a total violation of the law of one. Uh, of course, an infant would, would be included in that. Killing anything is a violation of the law of one because what God has made alive, let no man kill. What reality says should be alive, let no man take that life. That's one of the components of the law of one. But if somebody else wants to kill their infant, although I don't agree, and although I think it's always wrong, I don't want to stop them from exercising their free will and say, no, you can't do what you wanna do. I want to let everybody experience the consequences of their actions, whether positive or negative. So this is where the nuance comes in of like, well, I'm definitely not in favor of late term abortions or something, but it's like the law of one is very clear about this. Even the most advanced positive ETs, they give the negative room to express and to play and to do their thing. Cause again, they have to honor the free will of all, even the mm. negative. So they'll never stop the negative completely but they do certain things to prevent the negative from running too rampant. One of those things is called the quarantine. They say around third density planets, which are very vulnerable to the negative polarity, they, they create or project an energetic shield around the planet of love, which the negative can't move through. And they do that to keep negative ETs from coming to, I mean, can you imagine if there was no protection over third density planets in our universe, the negative polarity would take over every single third density planet. It'd be yeah. the only thing they cared about doing. So in order to stop the whole universe from being subsumed by the negative polarity, positive ETs are like in their great wisdom, understand we have to stop that from happening to a certain extent, but they say we do let little windows open into third density planets for the negative to come in on occasion because we have to give them some room to be who they are. So I feel the same way with like abortion or any kind of controversial issue. It's like, I don't want to stop anyone's free will because they need to experience it so they can learn. But I also don't want to give license to just free murder of innocent babies, no matter what. So I definitely am on the camp of like, let's allow maybe very early abortions. Again, even though I don't agree with it and I think it's wrong, it's a violation of the law of one. I want to give those people the freedom to do that if they want to do it but let's prevent the murder of late stage babies because that's also something that love would do. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it, it causes you to really think about these principles, I think, when yeah. you start to understand Within them. Within love one, the split that is, you know, if you could sum, sum, summarize it briefly, it's just this, that uh, generally the negative polarity seeks to serve the self, the positive polarity seeks to serve others. In that is a core question of, you know, at what point is self-love serving the self? Like uh, uh, at what point, so you have to take care of yourself to some, to some extent factually to mm -hmm. feel good. So when is taking care of yourself evil? You know, if you take the example of, of uh, abortion, you know, who's to say that that person, that position isn't like, you know, this is what's, what's best for, for me in this circumstance. You know, I'm 16 and I'm not, you know, I, I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's the right choice, but it's like, mm -hmm. at what point is the, the service to self, at what point is it positive? At what point is it negative? Like when, and when, What's the line in self-service? And furthermore, mm -hmm. you know, another core part of the um, negative polarity is control, and then the positive polarity is acceptance. Um, mm -hmm. So, and again, at what line is it okay to serve yourself and to control something? Like, what's the line there? Yeah. So that's something I struggle with every day. It's like, when am I being selfish? When am I taking care of myself? When am I controlling things? I have to fix them to like be of the highest order. And when am I operating from fear? So mm -hmm. where, where have you landed on that? Yeah. Well, the nuance here is that it really depends more on your perception than it does what you're doing. Mm -hmm. 
So taking care of yourself. Your question is, when does that cross the line into service to self? You know, the answer is never. Taking care of yourself, taking care of yourself never crosses into the negative. You absolutely deserve to be taken care of. You're the creator. You're an expression of God. You're a holy divine being, like all other beings are. So you can't you can't say you're truly living service to others if you're trying to serve others at the cost of yourself mm. because you're you're still in duality, right? You're still making yourself inferior to others. And the positive polarity doesn't do that. It says, "No, all is one." And so this is the chief principle of the law of one that when you again introduce it into any question starts to help you answer those questions. And so if all is one, and I am just as much the creator as you are and everybody, then there needs to be an equal level of service or I'm in duality somewhere. So Ross says something interesting. Ross says that- just, so, so Sorry to cut you off. So the, yeah. ba the balance is to be of equal parts or being taken care of yourself and others. Not quite. Okay. So I'll, I'll get to the answer here through this next statement. The law of one says that the service to self polarity serves the self at the cost of others, essentially, mm -hmm. by taking advantage of others, by using others, it serves itself. The positive polarity serves itself by serving others. Because again, this is the law of one, is that there is only one being. So it's impossible to do something to somebody you don't also do to yourself. This is the principle of oneness. So we call it the law of attraction or the law of reciprocity. But it means that if I bless you in any way, I have to receive that same blessing at some point and usually very quickly. And so the law of one says the, the positive polarity serves itself by serving others. So by me just being concerned with, you know, this is the way I live my life mm -hmm. is I wake up and I say, oh, who can I bless today? And yeah, that's, can I that's help literally somebody? also just a law of attraction. It's like, yeah. Whatever I give out to the universe, by law, I know I'll get back. Yep. Good or bad. Because what you, if all is one, then what you give is what you're asking for. Because mm -hmm. whatever you give to somebody else, the universe has to give it back to you because the universe is built on perfect balance. So this is what karma is and things. This is what religions, monolithic religions especially, have misunderstood for so, so long on our planet is that there isn't. Like, yes, there are consequences to sin, for sure, but it's not an angry, wrathful, bearded man in the sky who's going around dishing out punishment because of his big, angry ego that's offended. It's immutable, eternal laws, which the creator established from the beginning and cannot be changed. One of yeah. these is the law of reciprocity or attraction. It's like, you always get what you give. So this is one of the really, this is the most difficult aspect of being on the negative polarity is that you've got to figure out how to give people control and deception and manipulation without having to experience it yourself. So that negative polarity has to circumvent the law of karma somehow. And this is how they do it. They do it by making sure they really, really get your free will. Because if you agree, the more clear they can be about what they're doing to you, the less they're going to have to suffer the consequences. So you've seen this. We talk about this all over text sometimes that the negative polarity on our planet, whether you call that the deep state, the Illuminati, there's a certain level of, I call them controllers, because all they care about is controlling the planet. Whoever these people are, bankers, politicians, doesn't matter, they all serve the same philosophy, which is I want power, and you want power, and I want power, well, we can probably get it together if we work together. So it's not real unity, like the positive polarity. The positive polarity is so unified. It's like, hey, look, you don't have to ever do anything for me. I love you just as you are. I'll never stop loving you. There's nothing you can do to make me not love you. I don't need anything from you. Mm -hmm. It's like, now that's real unity, right? The negative is like, hey, if you have the same goal as me, let's work together and we can accomplish it. But as soon as we get that goal, you and me go back to infighting to see who gets to the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's false unity and false light. But so they will... They will try to get somebody to like, they'll kind of try to tell you what they're doing with these psyops. For example, a lot of people these days say, look, they're always telling us what they're going to do next. And it's very true, right? They always do. And that's because it's how they circumvent the karma 
of if they just roll up on your street out of nowhere and force you to take an injection, mm -hmm. they're going to have to experience some really severe consequences because that's a major violation of free will. Mm -hmm. But if they say, hey, come get a donut, come get a, you know, <laughs> we'll give you this injection. And, you know, we haven't tested it yet, but trust the science, trust the science. Yeah. And that's how they get people, right? You're a good person, right? You don't want to kill grandma, do you? No, no, you're not a grandma killer. And then you show up and you voluntarily get it. Mm -hmm. And now they don't have to experience the same violation that yeah. they just violated you with because mm -hmm. they they tricked you, right? Yeah. One trippy part of the law of one I want to move into next um, that I still can't exactly put together. I'm sure you have is um, two concepts. First, the concept of the higher self in and of itself that we have basically a super advanced yeah. godlike entity that has a direct hand in choosing our uh, catalysts and our path of growth. Uh, and that this part that trips me out the most is that the evil person who's controlling all of us has a positively polarized higher self. Yeah. That, you know, someone who's, who is, you know, a, a criminal or a rapist or something extreme, uh, Hitler, they have a higher self who's positively, positively polarized. So how does that make sense? How does, how does someone so bad how can someone so bad be guided to do the things they're doing by a super highly positively, positively polarized force? Yeah. How have you come to terms with that? Yeah, it's a fascinating topic from the law of one. To give the viewers context to this, Ra explains that the higher self is, you know, what we call the higher self, is literally the sixth density version of you. It's you from the future. What is six dimension? 60, just to people who don't know. Yeah, so we haven't gotten into the densities, but uh, the densities is, again, from my perspective, the best model of consciousness available. And it says that consciousness moves in these seven basic stages, which are the colors of the rainbow. They're also the seven energy centers of our body. So we have the seven densities in miniature through mm -hmm. our seven energy centers. So the densities, I, I give people the simple definition that you can think about the densities like the chakras of the universe. And so these are the levels that consciousness moves through. As the photon at each density vibrates a little bit faster, you know, the faster a photon vibrates, the more dense it is with light, right? If a photon's vibrating really quick, it'll look like a straight line. You won't even see the gap between the photons it's moving so fast. If it's moving really slowly, you'll just watch a single point go back and forth. So it doesn't look very dense with light. So the faster the photon moves, the denser the light is at that density, which means the more information is there, the more consciousness is there. So the densities in essence represent the ability of consciousness to express itself at any level. So the first density is the four elements, earth, water, fire, air, and maybe space, if you want to count that. Consciousness spends billions of years in planet form, rock form, oceans, volcanoes, magma, interacting, the, the elements, the tornadoes, you know, and eventually the planet will settle and harden and oceans and stuff find their place. And then the second density of consciousness begins where microbial life is formed and uh, ocean life, insects, plants, animals, all of this is second density. And then the third density where we are begins when any one of those species, and on our planet, it just so happens to be humans, does this really important thing where the mind sort of flips in on itself and becomes an object to itself and understands I exist or I am. That's third density. It's the density of self-awareness. And so fourth density is the fourth chakra, which is the heart. That's the awareness of love and unity, that all is one. There's only one being. The only way we can be happy in the universe is to love one another, just like Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Fifth density is the fifth chakra, throat chakra, which we know in Hinduism represents like wisdom, non-duality, spiritual discernment. So that's where love is Im imbued with wisdom and the powers of wisdom. And then the sixth density represents the sixth chakra of the third eye. And that's what they call the, the law of one density, where there has to be a perfect balance achieved between love and wisdom. And that's not as easy as it may sound. And it doesn't sound very easy, but <laughs> it's even harder than it sounds because you've got to balance love and wisdom at these extremely advanced levels of like serving entire planetary civilizations. It's like, hey, Lucas, what's the wisest but most loving balance of how to serve another planet in the universe? You'd be like, well, shit, man. I don't know. I have to go, <laughs> go be there and find out. Like, it's very complicated. 
So once the soul reaches perfect balance through the third eye chakra uh, between love and wisdom, you become the higher self. And Ra says, this is because at that stage of your development, your soul has gained all the polarity it can gain in the universe from being of service and all this stuff. So to keep advancing to the seventh density, crown chakra density, your soul has to do something a little more advanced. It has to up the ante. So what it does is the soul turns back in time and becomes a guide to every single incarnation it's ever lived, probably from third density forward, I would imagine. From the beginning of self-awareness to where they are now, the higher self serves every single lifetime. And again, with the perfect balance of love and wisdom, your higher self is bringing you the experiences that it believes you best need for your highest good. So that means it can't just bring you roses and patty cakes and rainbows all the time. It's got to challenge you and give, put you through some trials to bring out of you the love, the forgiveness, the patience. So we're all doing this in a future version of ourselves, and that's what we call the higher self. What you pointed out, Lucas, was that Ra says this really amazing statement, which is that according to our knowledge, they say, there are no negatively polarized higher selves or over selves. They say all higher selves are positively polarized. And they're like, whoa, this is shocking. So hold on, I gotta ask you some questions, Ra. Are you saying that even negatively polarized beings, like a fifth density negative entity, like a Darth Vader level, you know, he's got a positively polarized higher self? And Ra says, this is correct. And they explain the reason why is because the negative polarity, remember we said it's the polarity of illusion. Mm -hmm. It's based all based in illusion, the illusion of separateness. Well, that means it can't complete the journey back to source as it is. And that makes total sense, right? If it's based in illusion, that illusion must have an expiration date. There's only so long you can play around with shadows and dust before you get tired of it and say, okay, I wanna go back to reality now. And Ra says, it's at the point of, of mid sixth density. They said no negative entity in the history of the universe has figured out how to advance past that stage. Because to become the higher self, you have to do what? Be of service to hundreds of other lifetimes. And so you can't, a negatively polarized being couldn't serve their past lifetimes and be negatively polarized because service is positive. Service to others is positive. So they say essentially these negative entities, these very advanced negative entities, sixth density negative, like wow, they're just beating their head against a brick wall saying, I can't gain more polarity. No matter what I do, I've enslaved whole planets. I have a whole negative galactic federation under my control and I still can't gain more negative polarity. So Ra says, eventually they have to concede defeat in a sense mm -hmm. and say, all right, the positive is the true polarity. True meaning it's the polarity that's actually based in the creator's essential nature. And yeah. so they reverse polarity. Yeah. I want to get more detail into the question I asked specifically, I think people listening to this, if I was, if I didn't understand the law of one, if I, if I didn't have a higher density, I wouldn't be able to understand the fact that how can the most loving being version of ourselves not only allow us, but, but kind of like push us towards committing evil Yeah, as a negative uh, incarnation version of ourselves. Yeah. You know, like how, how, to those people, I just can't imagine how confused they are. So mm -hmm. let's, can you please add some clarity to that? Like how could the most loving, most positive version of ourselves yeah. allow ourselves to commit evil? Yeah. Well, you said the important statement was how can it, I don't know if you said allow to commit evil or encourage you to commit evil, but the higher self is actually not encouraging. Like the higher self literally doesn't want you to do any specific thing. Like they don't have a bias in it. They're just here to provide you with the best possible catalyst for whatever you choose. Maybe like maybe this higher self is serving a past version of itself that was negative, mm -hmm. you know, fourth density negative. And so the, the positive higher self is like, how do I bring negative catalyst to this version of me that needs yeah. to get more powerful this and controlling? Sorry to cut you off. I had a dot click in myself that if I, if I am the higher self, no, obviously I have a long way to go, but looking back <laughs> at me when I was negatively polarized, when I was in college and I was a manipulative drug addict, uh -huh. like I had to, if I didn't experience those things with that negative polarity, I wouldn't have polarized into the positive version I am now. Right. So it's like that had to have happened for me to get to where I am. So I imagine it has to be some similarity there. Like the higher self knows that it had to experience a negative polarization incarnation 
to become the higher self. Right. You know, that's that makes sense now. That's exactly right. And it's it's the understanding that a, a advanced, you know, sixth density positive being has, which is that there is no good or bad. Every single thing, every event, every point of energy contains its antithesis within it. And we know this, right? How many times in your life has an event happened that in the moment felt really bad, you know, uncomfortable, not good, wouldn't prefer it, wouldn't have chosen it. And yet it led you to some very good positive thing. Like you said, you learned, you grew, you gained wisdom, whatever. So the positive higher self would have no problem delivering a potentially negative experience to anybody, knowing that this soul is going to use it how it's going to use it. And it's either going to polarize positive or negative. I just want to give it a good catalyst. I don't care which direction it polarizes. Why? Because all beings in the universe eventually have to concede to the positive polarity. So even if they allow the negative okay. soul to That's go on. So you're saying that basically the higher self delivers a neutral catalyst that can be t can be perceived in a way to polarize you towards a positive or negative. Yes, that's super important. All catalyst is neutral. And a catalyst, according to the law of one, is really like any experience you have. Yeah, that makes sense. If you think of any any villain, any, for example, you know, Batman and the Riddler, sorry to be this com comic book nerd, but Batman <laughs> and the Riddler had the same catalyst. They're both, you know, orphan traumatized youth with, not, with you know, parents got right, killed. Right, right. And, you know, Batman took that as a, as a reason to help others not go through that. Perfect and the Riddler, example. And the Riddler used that as a, as a way to enact that pain upon others. But the, the catalyst was the same thing. It was early death of parents. Yes. Um, which then was used subjectively by both people to polarize one direction. Yes. So you're saying that basically, so if both Batman and the Riddler continue the path of negative or positive, they get to the same result of 60 positive no matter what. Yeah, exactly. It's the, the destination's guaranteed. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, I'm standing to lose something right now. Mm -hmm. You know, destination's guaranteed. Everything has to return back to the creator who is love. Mm -hmm. But here's a perfect analogy for you, bro. As you know, I'm a new parent. My daughter's only seven, eight weeks old. So I'm not at this stage yet. But you know how parents, when they have a, a one-year-old, a two-year-old, and as you're developing your child's cognitive abilities, you're playing games with them, giving them toys that help them to learn and grow and gain skills. So like I've seen videos of um, uh, parents playing with a kid that has that game where they have to put like, uh, they have to match the colors or something to from a card to a toy. And they put the card in front of the toy that matches the color. And they'll be like, which one's the yellow toy? And they'll grab a card and put it down. And so I've watched videos where a parent will purposefully confuse the child to see if they can figure out the mistake. So they'll put like the red card in front of the yellow toy and say, now, Tommy, can you tell me if this is good or bad or like right or wrong? And Tommy's like, hmm, and eventually figures out that toy yellow, but the card red. It's like, very good, Tommy. So I gave you a negative catalyst because I put something out of order, right? Mm -hmm. But I knew it was for your highest good and I'm trying to teach you and grow you. That's how your higher self is interacting with you. And it's honestly way more polarized than the difference between an adult and a child. The difference between a third density mind and a sixth density mind would be like 100x that difference. I mean, they are literally, when they're interacting with us, bringing us catalysts, it's way more than an adult playing a game with a child. You know, it's like they're coming so far down from their level to serve us. And so we can't really imagine it. So like your, your future version of yourself is looking at you in the third density, like a little third grader or mm -hmm. something. It's like, oh, what does little Aaron or little Lucas need today to grow into more love? And it seems advanced to us. You know, somebody cuts in front of me at Starbucks. Maybe my higher self creates a catalyst for me where somebody cuts in front of me at Starbucks and it, the, the higher self just wants to see, am I going to make a big fuss about it or say, oh, I love this person. They can yeah. go in front so of me. So our, our free will resides in our response to the catalyst. You got it. And so my mind goes is that I do believe, and I know I'm sure you agree with this too, that there is pre-programming in this dimension, that if you are destined to be a rock star, you will be a, a, a rock no star. Um, in the, I'm saying that is that like, the catalyst of the path towards being a rock star, what you're saying is that the choice you have is how you use the catalyst. Like you can either be the rock star who's selfish, a drug addict and a whore, yeah. or you use the power and fame to help other people to, the same, to, to as much as you can. So you can, yep. so basically 
the catalysts are predestined, whether it be, you know, children, rock star, uh, the big things in life, the yeah, canon events. Yeah, yeah. And the free will resides in how you use those events to be positively or negatively polarized. Yeah. It's a lot like a video game where you get to choose, you know, your soul has had 50 human lifetimes. You've made a lot of progress, but you're not quite at that graduation point mm -hmm. where your soul is ready for a fourth density lifetime. You're at the late stage of third density. And so you're talking with your higher self after uh, incarnation is over. You're on the uh, the other side, having your life review and all that. And your higher self is the guide that's there to not tell you what you should choose, but to say, well, Lucas, you know, you said you need to learn forgiveness. Why don't we program a uh, relationship betrayal in your next lifetime? Would you, does this sound like a good idea? And you're like, yeah, that sounds like the lesson I need. Let's do a relationship betrayal. And your soul is only going to choose a handful of like big catalysts, you know, early loss of a loved one as a child or something like that, because it's it, your soul knows exactly what stimulus it's going to put on you. It's going to force you to open your heart. Right. But this doesn't mean that every single experience you have was pre-programmed or even by the higher self. Law of one is clear on this. Most catalyst is random, meaning just by being in a third density body in a third density world, you're getting hit with all kinds of catalyst. And it's like, look, no one's too good for the basics, right? Even professional baseball players, they get out on the field and they throw the ball for a while to warm up. The pitcher throws, you know, 20, 30, 40 pitches to get his mechanics drilled in. So we're never too good for the basics. It's not like we stop needing to have challenges of it did, any it did, kind. I thought it did say that the more spiritually aware you are and polarized you are, the less the, random, the randomness occurs. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The less polarized you are, the more random you need it to be because it's like, look, you're so unevolved, you just need a bunch of stimulus. Yeah. You need everything, right? You haven't really passed any major tests yet. As you pass more tests, it's not that necessarily that those catalysts will completely stop showing up for you. They will get a lot less often in your life for sure. But it's that when they show up, you just handle them so differently. And like it's normal to you now not to stress out when the bank account gets low or whatever lesson you've integrated, right? It's just like this is a new part of who you are. So it's not a challenge anymore. So you'll still experience the randomness of life. It's not like your life will become so perfectly organized or something. Mm -hmm. You're still in a human lifetime, but your development is so much more mature that you meet everything with love, with patience, with kindness. So really the advanced souls are choosing really tough lessons. Like, let me go be, let me make a big impact on the world in some form. Let mm -hmm. me overcome a great loss of some sort. Yeah. When my mind goes now to when, you know, you, you knowing you well, you're always in, in immense praise and gratitude to the, to God and the creator when things, whatever happens in your life happens. Um, what is it that you're thinking like when, when something great happens, you know, uh, for example, let's say your, your daughter saved herself from injury and you're like, thank you, God. What are you yeah. thinking? Like, what, what is, what, what are you thinking? Is it, to what extent is the higher self helping out? To what extent is it God? I honestly have don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is the quintessential question of humanity. When, when you say thank you, God, what is it? Like, what what is it that you're thanking? Like, what yeah. what's what's that force that's that's giving you something worth being grateful for? Yeah. Gratitude is the best way to stay connected to source, because yes, you know, non duality students make this argument all the time. Why do you say praise God? Why do you thank God? Why do you worship God? There's no God outside of you. It's just you. So who is there to praise, right? That whole thing. And it's like, I get it. I get it. That's true. From the absolute highest level, there's just God. So who am I thanking? But the reality is I'm not experiencing that I am God. Like physically speaking, I'm experiencing one particular person named Aaron. And Aaron Abke's whole lifetime, his entire mind, his development, his evolution, I'm stuck in the framework of Aaron Abke during this incarnation. And that's for a reason. It's not an accident. So I'm supposed to experience God through the prism of Aaron Abke. Mm -hmm. So me as Aaron Abke, loving God, serving God, devoting my life to God is the way God wanted to experience itself through this lens of Aaron Abke. So why would I not worship God when clearly God created this mm -hmm. lens called Aaron Abke to know itself through? Second of all, my immediate experience 
is the separateness of the physical vehicle that it creates. I do, I'm not experiencing floating in bliss consciousness in a non-physical form forever, right? I'm experiencing a physical life with physical challenges, physical pain. And so all those things provoke feelings of separateness and it traps you in this illusion, the Maya of this human dream world. It's like, I know it's not real, but damn dude, it feels and looks super real. So it's like, let's be honest about the fact that we do feel like we're separate from God a bit, at least somewhat, mm -hmm. if not a lot. I do feel like there's a division between myself and God. I know it's not true, but my senses, my experience is constantly trying to reinforce, you're a body, you're a person, you're separate. So what do I do to overcome that dream world, that programming, and integrate a higher level of awareness that everything is God, it's just God here? Well, you can start by thanking God for everything, because if that's true, if there's only God, then everything is God's action. Everything is the power of God in motion. Even people that are using the God power negatively, even people that use the God power for destruction and harm, they're still using the one and only power that there is. So to give God all the praise for anything good that happens is a, a very helpful spiritual practice for staying connected to that awareness. What about I, giving God praise when things go bad? Exactly. When things go bad, my approach to when things go bad, when there's a challenge, when I'm put up against the wall, mm -hmm. so to speak, is to say, thank you, God, for this big challenge. Because I know the bigger the challenge, the bigger the reward is. And so I can see you're asking me to open my heart more here or whatever. So thank you for this challenge. I accept it. I'm going to do my best, God. And it's sort of like what any, any good parent and what their child to say to them. If a parent gave their child a challenge to overcome, you'd want to hear, thanks, dad, I'll do my best. It's like, cool, son, love you no matter what the result is. Mm -hmm. And I'm just glad that that's your attitude. God just wants us to have the, the right attitude. God doesn't really care at all what we actually do. God cares about the intention of our heart. And the intention is what actually directs the law of one itself. Mm -hmm. I wanted to close with a kind of strange topic, but I think it's a worthy exploration in the realm of politics nice um you know you and i both like uh trump which is a you know controversial topic nowadays because you have the the left outright hating him and thinking he was a nazi and you have the conspiracy theorist types seeing him as like the the false messiah who was just like the same as everyone else mm -hmm. so i'd like for you this strange question but using the law of one using the the, the understanding of polarity communicate why someone like trump is needed in this dimension to help push more positivity? Oh man, what a fun question. Yeah, I mean, let's look at all the different contexts we've laid out in this conversation of like, we need the negative and God uses the negative. And I'm not saying Trump's negative, but there's things about yeah, he Trump. He has some negative, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying he is negative, but yeah. like there's definitely a lot of things about Trump that people see as negative. And uh, I'm gonna take a different approach actually. I really love appreciating the incredible, you know, invention that is Donald Trump on behalf of the universe. Because again, I live in a perception where it's like, there's just what reality is doing. So like Kamala Harris is what reality is doing. Donald Trump is what reality is doing. Reality itself, God itself is making these characters that are playing this game on the human stage. And when you look at where we're at, where it's like, how could we be? I, I literally can't think of how we could be more polarized on either side. Mm -hmm. You have one candidate that has done like one or two TV interviews for the presidency for her term running for presidency. Other than that, she is being hidden and kept away from the media. And the other candidate has survived as many assassination attempts as the other candidate has done interviews. It's mm -hmm. like, I never could have imagined I would see a day where I would say that about yep. American politics. So it's like, don't you appreciate the way that Trump provokes people? I just love it. I'm like, what a masterful invention from the universe because I see the way the left sees Trump and I see the way the right sees Trump. And it's like, they're both correct in a, from a certain sense. Now, any sort of like hate-filled judgment is never correct. But what I mean is the left points out the narcissism the lying, the stuff that I would say, that's objectively true. It's that's, very yeah. clear that Trump doesn't tell the truth sometimes, is very narcissistic sometimes. But here's the nuances. I'm 
Maybe where I differ from the average leftist's view of Trump is that I'm under no delusion that you're going to get a perfect person for any position in politics. And just because you don't see all the nasty, horrible, vile, despicable things that Joe Biden says, that Kamala Harris says, that Barack Obama says, doesn't mean they don't say them and do them. And we know of many despicable things those people do, which I think is way worse than saying some derogatory remark. So like I look at Trump and I'm like, yeah, but everyone has all kinds of personality flaws. Everyone has a huge, big, fat, narcissistic ego. And I'm aware of that because this is all I study for a living is how mm -hmm. the ego works. And I, every person I meet, the first thing I notice about them is how big or small their ego is, like how developed they are in their relationship to ego. Yeah. If somebody has a big ego and they're not very integrated, it's the first thing I notice about them. And it provokes great love and compassion I see where everybody is and it's, it's all good where they are, but I see where Trump is and I'm like, he's got some big shadows he hasn't worked on, but he's got a lot of light too. He's got a lot of good qualities in him. And so I come back to this every time when I'm asked this question, it's like, I love Joe Biden. I love Kamala Harris. I love Donald Trump. I love everybody because we're all children of the one God. And I refuse to hate anybody. I refuse to judge anyone. But he said this, but she did that. Don't care. Everyone's fallible. Everybody makes mistakes. Everyone's on a journey. What's most important is that I stay true to who I am, which is I will hate nobody. I will always abide by the law of one. I will never infringe on free will. And so those are more of the qualifications I judge a candidate by in terms of like who I would vote for. And I, I don't vote, but if I did vote, like who, which side would I lean towards? I think with Trump, it's the authenticity factor is, you know, seeing him through the rights perspective of Trump. It's his authenticity that is, I, in my opinion, the number one reason why he has such a massive, rabid following in America. It's because we've been inundated with fake plastic puppet politicians on the TV screen for decades and decades and decades. And we watch these people read off note cards, like from the podium. We watch them reading in teleprompter. Hello, America. This evening, I come to you to address important issues from our nation. And you're watching Biden reading off a teleprompter and you're like, stop, cut, what's going on? Are you really trying to pass this off to me? That this is my leader? This guy's reading a script that somebody else wrote for him. Mm -hmm. Who is running my country? And of course, I'll do this. If you elect me, I'll do that. They never do it. Trump, at least, when he talked, you could tell he wasn't reading off no teleprompter. You know, and that's why he says a lot of the things that the left gets triggered about because he's not being reined in, right, by his, his producers or whatever, like Kamala or Joe Biden are. So there's just a huge segment of America that's like, that's my guy. Oh, but he has all these personality flaws. Don't care. He's being authentic. Authenticity is the number one issue for most voters of, I cannot stomach one more fake, plastic, polished politician who's getting on a stage, assuming that they can fool me, that they're speaking from their own mind and heart. I know they're not. I know they're being groomed by a giant cabinet of deep state actors who want to take over the country and take power. And this is where a lot of people are. And it's going back to the law of one. It's the free will thing. It's like, I'd rather hang out with the snake that I can see versus the snake that I can't see. And so it's even though this one side is speaking in flowery platitudes and all this stuff, what they do, Afghanistan withdrawal, the border, um, inflation, wrecking the economy, multiple foreign wars, $400 billion spent on the military complex. These are just heinously terrible things for humanity. But Lucas, they speak so great. They never mm -hmm. say anything triggering. They never get into trouble with the media. So people are waking up to this and it's like, I'll take the guy that's messy and rough around the edges, who's making the decisions himself, talking off the top of his own head, really actually communicating what he thinks and believes. And, you know, Trump, at least from my perspective, did the vast majority of things he said he would do, unlike the typical politician, which will maybe do 10% of what they say they'll do when they're running. Trump did probably 80, 90%. And you could argue that other percentage was there's some difficulties being president with Congress and the Senate, and you got to have people on your side. So I don't think any president can do every single thing they say they're going to do, mm -hmm. but at least you want to see that they're going to try and they're going to make their best effort. And Trump said, I'm going to build a wall. And he tried. Now, these are the things that I think people look at that 
I don't think the left understands how the right sees Trump from that regard. Because again, they project and say, well, they're all just evil Hitler Nazis. That's why they like him. So they're in fantasy land, right? But the right does the same thing, thinking that the left are just a bunch of communist evil Marxists who you know, want tyranny and stuff. It's like, no, that's not true either. So how do you get those two sides to agree? I don't know if you do, but a polarizing figure like Donald Trump, who brings out the best and the worst of everybody, I think is a very good thing for our planet because it's real. It's raw. When you hear Trump talk, he's going to provoke you to a reaction and you get to see what's inside of you. Well, thank you for the uh, political take. It was a little, you know, out of uh, left field, but I think it's uh, important. I just wanted to give an example of how we can use the law of one as a lens to understand yes. everything in life, politics, man. Uh, philosophy, religion from that lens. And that was a beautiful example of how to do that. I just wanted to close and thank you. You and I can talk about this for, for ages, but you know, just from like a, a personal level, so the viewers can get to know us a little better. I would, I would identify two versions of myself, one before I met you, one after. So it was like, oh, a, wow. As, a, as your, you know, soul brother out here, I just want to say, you know, just as someone who, who loves you and you're just a close friend of yours, like the impact you have on me as a person just being around you has been monumental in becoming more positively polarized, loving the self and family, family members are asking what's happened to you. And it's just through, <laughs> you know, being with you. So I'm, I'm saying that, uh, you know, because just it's, it's evidence of the efficacy of your energy, uh, your knowledge and your wisdom. So I just want to say that as a thank you very much for yeah. helping mold me into a much better man at my age. Um, and to the viewers know the kind of man you are as well. Yeah, well, thank you, brother. That's uh, a huge honor to hear that. And it was on this very podcast in, in this room that we met for the first time. Was that in January or February? I don't know. And uh, yeah, we became besties since then, man. And uh, started working out with our buddy James for what, six months now or so. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just getting to hang out so often with another soul brother on the same frequency has been a massive blessing to me. And uh, if you guys notice Lucas looking a little more built or stacked, <laughs> you can thank me. For it's that. because of him, solely because <laughs> of him, um, for sure. I'm not saying that uh, facetiously. Um, well, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Likewise, until, man. Until next time. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you want to watch more content, please click this video right here and don't forget to subscribe right here. Thank you.